Ladies and gentlemen, please find your seats and silence your mobile devices. Our program will resume shortly. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats and silence your mobile devices. Our program is about to begin. Thank you.
ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Senior Advisor in the Office of the Under Secretary of State for Civilian Security, Democracy, and Human Rights, Pam Pryor. Thank you. There is a passage in Isaiah 61 that says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for prisoners. <laughs> The, the guy's a good author, <laughs> no doubt. Andrew Brunson, an American pastor from North Carolina, used that passage in his sermons. I doubt that he ever thought that he might be one of the captives or the prisoner that needed to be released from darkness. But that's where we find him now, in a Turkish prison on specious charges. One week ago, Andrew Brunson, who has pastored the Resurrection Church in Izmir, Turkey, went to trial for the third time. He has been wrongfully imprisoned since October 7th of 2016. And this time we all held our breath. Would this be the time that Andrew Brunson would walk out a free man? The chatter was high, and we really did think that this was the day. But then, in a stunning overthrow of hope, he was remanded back to prison until another court date in this October. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo recently told the Christian Broadcasting Network, Pastor Brunson's case is very much a focus of the team that I lead here at the State Department. And we're optimistic that in the days and weeks ahead, we'll get a good outcome for Pastor Brunson his family, and frankly, for many of those that are held in places around the world. Now, I work here at State, and I know how focused everyone is on Andrew Brunson. We get weekly updates, and this administration is truly working on ways to make sure that this innocent American and others wrongfully detained are released. And while I anguish and despair and hope and pray, I'm not his family. I'm not his mother who shares my first name, nor Noreen, his wife, nor his two sons, nor his daughter, Jacqueline. For them, this is pure torture and imprisonment of a different sort. Today, we are honored to hear from Pastor Brunson's daughter, Jacqueline Funari. She grew up in Turkey and loves the Turkish people as her father taught her to do so. Married now, Jacqueline lives in the US. And by the way, they just had a civil ceremony. They're still waiting for her dad to get out and do the one with the big dress and the church. Married now, Jacqueline lives in the US and she has spoken out on her father's behalf to Congress and also to the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva. Just like we saw this administration bring home a young man from Utah imprisoned in Venezuela recently, and three Americans forcefully detained in North Korea as we watched them deplane in the middle of the night at Andrews Air Force Base, we all wait and hope with you, Jacqueline. One day soon, we all wanna be at your father's arrival ceremony on US soil. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct honor to present to you Jacqueline Brunson Funari. Thank you, Pam, and thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of my father, Pastor Andrew Brunson. My father has been unjustly detained in Turkey since October 7, 2016, after having lived peacefully there for 23 years. He has loved and served the people of Turkey, pastoring a small Protestant congregation. But all that changed on October 7, 2016, when my father arrived home to find a written summons to report with his passport to a local police station. 
Believing the summons was related to his routine application for a renewal of his residence visa, my father promptly reported to the Izmir police, only to be arrested and informed that an order of deportation had been entered against him, as he had suddenly been deemed a threat to national security. He was to be held in the Harmandala uh, Detention Center pending deportation. However, my father was never deported. Instead, he remains in unjustly incarcerated in Turkey, wondering if he has been forgotten, as today marks the 656th day of his imprisonment. After his arrest, my father continued to remain in detention at the Harmandala Center and was denied access to an attorney until December 9, 2016, over two months later when he was transferred in the middle of the night to a high security prison in Izmir. At that time, he was informed that he was being detained as a suspect, although evidence had yet to be gathered on the absurd grounds of membership in an armed terrorist organization. The ensuing months were filled with multiple appeals contesting his continued detention, which cited legal deficiencies of such a decision and all of which were summarily denied, even though no evidence had been set forth to substantiate any crime. While in prison, my father has lived under inhumane conditions and has spent extended periods of time in a cell meant for eight people, but which at times has held as, as many as 22 prisoners, of which my father is always the only Christian. During his incarceration, he has lost over 50 pounds. He has lost precious time with his family that can never be replaced. But worst of all, he has lost hope, wondering why Turkey, a NATO ally and a country he loves and has served for over two decades, has been able to hold him hostage, an innocent United States citizen, for nearly two years. During this ordeal, my father's plight has caught the attention of the world, with over half a million people signing a petition demanding his release. There have also been an unprecedented amount of high-level demands for my father's release. And yet, it wasn't until March of this year that my father was finally charged with any crime, over a year and a half since his initial arrest and detention. And although Turkey has repeatedly claimed that my father's arrest has nothing to do with him practicing his faith, incredibly, this 62-page indictment actually identifies my father's crime as Christianization, equating it to terrorism and espionage. Furthermore, more than half of the indictment, which is wholly lacking any merit, is based on a secret witness's testimony, which has been reported to be the exact same testimony the secret witness used in a separate case to extort from funds from another religious group in which the court threw out as, a holy, as wholly lacking in merit. It, be it has become very clear to the world, once the indictment was issued, that Turkey has absolutely no evidence indicating my father did anything wrong. The trial dates have further proven th that fact. He has now had three trial dates, one on April 16th, one on May 7th, and one on July 18th, just this past week. It is important to note that during these three days, there has not been one prosecution witness that has been able to provide one shred of evidence to support their ridiculous testimony. A fact that my father has specifically pointed out during the May 7th trial date, and a fact that none of the judges on the panel seem to care about, as the head judge personally told my father that all the prosecution's witness testimony would simply be taken as truth, and therefore there was no need for any evidence. Furthermore, the court has stated that they will not allow anyone named as a suspect in the indictment to testify on my father's behalf. As the indictment names over 60 suspects, many of whom have personal knowledge and evidence to refute the ridiculous charges against my father, the court has effectively denied him a defense. My father has and continues to adamantly maintain his innocence and deny all the accusations. He has reiterated that his sole purpose for being in Turkey for the past 24 years was for one purpose only, to tell about Jesus Christ. He has further stated that he has done this openly in front of the government. As a sham trial has played out before the eyes of the world, it is evident that there is no case against my father and that Turkey does not intend to even try to pretend that a fair trial is taking place. And so the question remains, why is Turkey still holding him? President Erdogan has actually answered this question on several occasions as he and the Turkish government continue to demand a swap of my father for Fethullah Gülen, the cleric Erdogan blames for the failed coup attempt in July of 2016. Thus, my father's incarceration has simply been a bargaining chip for Turkey. However, I would submit that President Erdogan has mistakenly been led to believe my father's value lies simply in being a pawn in a swap. In reality, 
My father's greatest value to Turkey lies in President Erdogan's approval of his immediate release back to the U.S. as a sign of goodwill and as a major step toward restoring amicable relationships between Turkey and the United States, an invaluable move with immeasurable and long-lasting benefits. We should use every effort to make sure that President Erdogan gets that message. My family has suffered greatly because of these absurd and false charges. My father should not be a pawn to be used in a political game. He's been falsely imprisoned for far too long. Having myself grown up in Turkey, it's been hard for me to understand the current state of events. My parents moved to Turkey in 1993, so that's where my, par that's why, that's where my brothers and I grew up. To me, it was home. I grew up in a mix of Turkish and American culture, and I loved seeing the beauty in both. My family loved and respected the Turkish people, and my parents were dedicated to serving them for as long as they could. My brothers and I used to joke that we'd have to take our future children to Turkey someday to see their grandparents. As I grew up, I saw how my father poured himself into his work and how willing he was to sacrifice his needs for the sake of others. He believed, as I do, in a greater purpose in life and actively lived out his life with the purpose of showing people the love and grace of God. He taught this message in the home, too. My parents' continued commitment to serving God and the people of Turkey was such a wonderful example for both my brothers and I to see. I know my dad and his character, as only a daughter can, and I know that the charges against him are absolutely absurd and false. He is not an armed terrorist trying to overthrow any government. He is a pastor who went to Wheaton College, then on to seminary, and got a PhD in New, in New Testament. He has selflessly served Turkey for 24 years now, coming up to 25 this coming August. Every single thing in his life is centered on his faith, which is why seeing these absurd charges brought against him has been extremely painful for my family to experience. In February of 2017, as Pam mentioned, I got married, and neither of my parents were present. I will never get that moment back. For those of you who have daughters, I, I know that you understand how important and special it is to both you and your daughter to be able to walk her down the aisle at her wedding. My father didn't get to do that. And I'm still waiting for my wedding. I'm still wait, waiting to wear the wedding dress that I got two years ago. I'm still waiting for my dad to walk me down the aisle, and I'm still waiting for that father-daughter dance. I graduated from college in, uh, in December. And one of the ways my father has really showed his love to my brothers and I is he's invested so much in helping us plan out our futures and our career paths. And he missed seeing me achieve yet another life milestone. And my brother's graduating from college this coming December as well, and he would love to be at least at that one. In his letters, this is what my dad is, says is the hardest part of his imprisonment, is missing out on being with his family. He's missed out on being with my older brother and helping him make career choices and witnessing his accomplishments at Cornell. He has missed being with my younger brother, who has so badly needed his mom and dad in the last year and is now a senior in high school. These are the things that pained my dad the most, not being able to be with us and missing out on life with his family. In August of 2017, I took a risk and flew to Turkey to visit my father. It was the first time that I'd seen him in a year and the only time I've seen him in the last two. I will never forget any moment of the day we got to visit. I remember hearing my dad's voice for the first time in a year as they brought him into the room. I remember how broken, tired, and desperate he sounded as he tried to fight with every fiber in his being to meet in a room where he could at least hug us and hold us for the only hour he would have seen us in the entire year. We saw the entire visit. It was hard to fit any words in because the emotions were too strong and only led to more tears. And I know it was difficult for him to have my brother and I see him in such a condition. During my summer visit, he was already talking about how fearful he was of facing the cold winter in that poorly insulated prison. And to me, that he was already concerned about the winter in the middle of August shows how hopeless he was. And yet, he was forced to endure again the cold that he feared so much. My father is now dealing with a lot of anxiety and depression, and he's been permanently changed by this experience. Even when this ordeal is over, he'll never be the same person that he was. That being said, I cannot tell you how proud I am of my father and what an example of Christ's love he continues to be. Oh, sorry. <laughs> the example of Christ's love he continues to be to the world as he endures a wrongful imprisonment for his faith. In his trial last week, 
My father forgave the witnesses who have falsely testified against him, saying, My faith teaches me to forgive, so I forgive those who testified against me. He went on to say, It is a privilege to to suffer for the sake of Christ. Sorry. (laughs) Blessed am I as I suffer for him. Blessed am I as I am slandered. Blessed am I as I am lied about. Blessed am I as I am imprisoned. Blessed am I as I share his suffering. Wonderful, wonderful testimony. And I'd ask you to pray for the release of my father and for all those who are wrongfully imprisoned because of their faith. Thank you. This is where I'm supposed to say thank you, Jacqueline. So thank you, Jacqueline. (laughs) And uh, we look forward to having your dad here with us next year. Ladies and gentlemen, Please welcome Assistant Secretary of State for Educational and Cultural Affairs, Marie Royce. Hello, my name is Marie Royce and I'm the Assistant Secretary of State for Educational and Cultural Affairs. And it's truly an honor for me to be here today with you, leaders who are advancing religious freedom around the world. But before I tell you about our next speaker, I wanted to take a moment to tell you a little bit about the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs, also known as ECA. Being able to engage with the leaders of tomorrow on behalf of the United States of America allows ECA to ensure that future world leaders understand America's values firsthand. Our track record of success is absolutely unparalleled. Currently, one in every three world leaders is an ECA alumna or alumnus. All ECA programs introduce the world to American values and traditions, including the right to freely worship or not worship as you choose. When it comes to religious freedom, President Trump said it best. We must diligently guard, preserve, and cherish this unalienable right. For years, ECA has provided exchanges designed to broaden religious tolerance and bring together different religious groups from around the world. For this ministerial, ECA has designed and committed to running five new programs dedicated to advancing religious freedom worldwide. We know our work is effective because of alumni of ECA programs have gone on to establish organizations such as the Network of Young Muslim Leaders Against Violent Extremism in Spain and the Nonviolent Communication for Resilient Communities in Benin. I'll bet that we probably have a number of accomplished ECA alumni leaders right here in this room. But now it's time to introduce a leader who many of you will recognize, Mip Mulvaney. A lifelong Carolinas resident, Director Mulvaney has dedicated many years to serving first the people of South Carolina and now through his appointment to the cabinet by President Trump, the citizens of the United States of America. He graduated with honors in international economics Commerce and Finance from the Georgetown School of Foreign Service. After college, Director Mulvaney received his law degree on a full academic scholarship from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He completed his formal education at Harvard Business School's Owner President Management Program in 2006. He's an entrepreneur who practiced law 
ran the family real estate business, and started a home building company. From 2006 to 2010, Director Mulvaney served in the South Carolina legislature as both an assemblyman and as a senator. In 2010, Director Mulvaney was elected to South Carolina's fifth congressional district and became the first Republican to hold the seat in 128 years. Director Mulvaney was reelected four times and gained national acclaim for his work to limit the nation's debt and improve our regulatory environment. In December 2016, then President elect Donald Trump tapped Mick Mulvaney as his choice to be the Director of the Office of Management and Budget. President Trump stated Director Mulvaney is a very high energy leader with deep conviction for how to responsibly manage our nation's finances and save our country from drowning in red ink. Speaker Paul Ryan noted, Director Mulvaney is someone he greatly respects and has come to rely on. Director Mulvaney is an incredibly busy man, wearing two hats, as he also currently serves as acting director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. He's a founding member of the Indiana Land Rotary, a member of St. Philip Neri Catholic Church, and a founding member of Our Lady of Grace Catholic Mission. He's been married to Pamela since 1998, and they are the proud parents of triplets. Ladies and gentlemen, Director Mick Mulvaney. I feel bad because my presentation is probably shorter than the introduction. Um, I, I know that you're probably wondering to yourself, what, um, what can the budget director bring to this discussion and why am I here? Um, and I'm sort of wondering that myself. Um, I, I don't have um, the experiences that I understand many of your speakers uh, have already shared with you today. I certainly don't have the experience that that young woman had before. Um, I've never been the victim of religious persecution. But if you give me a few minutes, I'm going to tell you how I arrived here and then why I'm here. Um, I, uh, about five or six years ago, some of you may be familiar with Congressman Jeff Fortenberry, who's a friend of mine. We served together in the, uh, in the federal legislature. And five or six years ago, he said, look, there's a very small group of Catholic lawmakers from all over the world that get together um, every summer for a weekend just outside of Rome to talk about issues that are facing Catholic Christians uh, around the world. Um, and he was looking for a couple of members. It's not open to all the members of Congress. It's a very small group. I think that year we took three or four members of Congress, and for those of you who aren't familiar, there's about 500 of us. Um, so three or four of us went. Um, and I'll, uh, I'll never forget one of the first stories I'd heard at that time. Uh, that our guests um, at that first meeting were some of the Eastern Catholic leaders. Um, the Christian faiths, they're in communion with Rome, but they're not, um, not under the Pope. Um, and it was a fabulous sort of uh, cultural exposure for me. Um, and it was the very beginning of, of, of learning about what ISIS was, or at least as the world was coming to know what ISIS was. And I remember asking them, I thought that they would be asking me for something very simple. I thought they'd be asking me as a, as a, as a, as a, as a uh, U.S. congressman for help in emigrating, getting out to get to the United States. Um, and I raised that issue. He said, no, that's the last thing that we want. That's exactly what, what ISIS wants. They want to just remove the Christian presence um, from, from Iraq and Syria. He said, no, we want to stay. We just need some help. And I said, okay, that's fine. And we talked about it over the course of the next couple of years. We were able to continue the dialogue. Um, the next year, I came back um, and met with some of the same uh, folks again, and the message was entirely changed that time. Um, at the last, at, at the opening night dinner, one of the patriarchs got up, and he had spoken the year before and talked to me about, you know, not needing help emigrating, just needing other assistance. And he got down on his knees in front of the podium and said, I know what I told you last year. Um, forget what I told you last year. It's different now. Um, they're going to kill every single one of us if we give them the chance to do so. And he told me the story about what real terror is like. And many of you may have, have experienced it firsthand, so I, I can't, I could never uh, give the same impression, the same emotion of somebody who's lived through it. But for someone who's hearing it secondhand, it was powerful. He said that uh, this is what real terror is like. Real terror is living in the Christian quarter uh, in a town in eastern Syria uh, and having somebody knock on your door at night and come in and say, hi, we're here uh, from ISIS. Um, 
We're here to collect the tax. Uh, we know that, the, I can't remember the name of the tax under Sharia law, but here are the tax. Uh, last year it was $5 for sake of discussion. This year it's $500,000. Um, don't feel bad if you, uh, if you can't pay the tax. Uh, you, we're giving you two choices, um, which is either conversion or death. Um, how do you feel about conversion? Um, the whole family is standing there, and when the, when the father typically would say no to the conversion, they'd kill the oldest child in front of him. And then they wait and have the same question again and kill the next child, the next child, and kill the mother and kill the father last. And he said typically they would do it only one or two houses a night. One or two houses a night. Everybody knew they were coming out again the next night. That's terror. Um, terror is, is not knowing what's not going to happen. It's knowing it's going to happen. You just don't know when. And I remember telling him that I, I had a difficult time processing that as a Western Catholic. I thought religious persecution was trying to explain to my Protestant friends that Catholics really are Christian. Okay? This is something we deal with in the South. It's no big deal. Um, that's not religious persecution. Um, not, being able to get, not being able to get fish in the public schools on Sunday is not religious persecution. Uh, excuse me, on Fridays during Lent. Um, that is real persecution. Um, and as I talked to him about it more and more, he explained it to me in a way that has, has stayed with me since that conversation, which is he says, Mick, what you don't understand is living in the West, living in the U.S. as a Christian, you live in a post-Constantinian world. You live in the world that it's, you don't know what it's like to have been martyred for the cause. It's too, it's, it's, it's too remote for you. He said, in the East, this is, we can still be killed for our faith. And it's, there's a disconnect between the East and the West when it comes to that type of, that is completely foreign to me. Uh, I, I cannot imagine what that is like. I'm trying to, um, which is one of the reasons I'm here. We learned other stories, by the way. We learned that also persecution goes much, um, it, it's, it's oftentimes stops far short of, of life and death matters. One of the things that stuck out of my mind the most was we have a large group of, of, of uh, men and women from sub-Saharan Africa who came to explain to me and to Jeff Fortenberry, who's on the Appropriations Committee and actually spends the money in the House, how our U.S. taxpayer dollars are used to discourage Christian values in other democratic countries. It was stunning to me that my government under previous administration would go to folks in sub-Saharan Africa and say, we know that you have a law against abortion, but if you enforce that law, you're not going to get any of our money. We know you have a law against gay marriage, but if you enforce that law, we're not going to give you any money. Um, that's a different type of religious persecution, and I'm not trying to put them on a moral equivalency between death and that, but that is a different type of persecution that I never expected to see. I never expected to see that as an American Christian, uh, that we would be doing that to other folks. Um, so why am I here? Uh, I'm here for a couple of reasons. Um, number one, just to let you know um, that there are many, many people in our government, in both parties, who care about the issues that you are going to be talking about over the course of the next couple of days. We simply don't have the time, the attention, the bandwidth to make it our priority. Uh, I'm the budget director. I run the Bureau of Consumer Financial Protection. I have two jobs. I have 2,200 people working for me. I don't have time to do it, but I want to help. There are a lot of people here who just want to change outcomes. There are a lot of people in this government who just want to see things done differently. They want to do something. I've been going now to Rome for five or six years. I've been talking about this for five or six years. Fortberry and I have talked several times about how we're tired of talking about stuff. I think we all know now the scope of this problem, or at least we're starting to grasp the scope of this problem. What can we do? I have no idea what the answer to that question is. But I trust Ambassador Brownback, and I'm so excited that the president actually made a commitment as part of this new administration to put somebody of his, his credibility and his stature in a role like this. I'm, so, I'm just ecstatic that the vice president is coming to speak to you on Thursday. He has been engaged in this. He's met the same um, Eastern um, uh, patriarchs that I met. We actually brought them here. The ICLN brought them here to meet face to face with the vice president, which we've done a couple times now. There is an interest in this government to help people on this issue. So the more you can do to tell us, point us in the right direction, uh, the more we'd greatly appreciate it. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back Ambassador Sam Brownback. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Director Mulvaney, and I uh, hope all of you have been having a fabulous first day. Uh, I, I, this, my heart's leaping with joy. I'm just happy of how this has gone. My side meetings have been fantastic. The, the eclectic nature of the discussion has been wonderful. Uh, and people not caring what it is that you believe or what your belief is, but just that you're coming together around one topic of religious freedom, and it's something if we pull together, we can all get done together. Uh, and I just, I'm, I'm very pleased at how this is going, and I hope you're enjoying it uh, as well. We're going to end the first day uh, with an absolute stem winder. Uh, and uh, so, you know, you, you get, get ready. You're, you're going to be out of your seat uh, on this one. And this is, uh, Frank Wolf is a dear friend of mine. He's mentored me for years, uh, and he's really the godfather of this field uh, for the United States. Frank has been at this for years. He was one of the original architects of the 1998 Religious Freedom Act uh, that I helped pass in the Senate, but he was the architect of. He was the guy that was here uh, first. Uh, he was country before country was cool uh, in the old saying. Uh, he, he was at this and was pointing this out as a major issue long before State Department would admit to it being an issue uh, or want to engage it much at all. Uh, so really, uh, Frank, this is, a, this is a product of your effort of years, decades of your effort. The last Religious Freedom Act that would, would, was the uh, one that, that was recently reauthorized in 2016 was even named the Frank Wolf International Religious Freedom Act. And it was done that for a purpose because Frank's been really the father of this field. Uh, he's delighted to see this taking place now. Uh, he continues to be very active. He and I were just recently in northern Iraq uh, with Yazidi and Christians that are persecuted. He continues to carry it in his heart. He continues to push this topic. We talk regularly about what he's focused on and where he thinks the U.S. government should be focused. So if you would, uh, join me in recognizing that the man that really started this all, by God's grace, Frank Wolf. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Brownback. I appreciate it very much. I want to thank uh, the Trump-Pence administration. I want to thank Secretary of State Pompeo. I want to thank Ambassador Brownback and all of the State Department employees who worked to put this ministerial to advance international religious freedom on. I also want to thank all of you for attending and for all the good work that you do. Many of you know the words of the song, The Boxer, that Simon and Garfunkel sang in Central Park. It says, man hears what he wants to hear and disregards the rest. There are the cries of the persecuted that we are refusing to hear. The Bible has much to say about persecution, oppression, and ultimately freedom. In Ecclesiastes 4.1, it says, Again, I looked, I saw all the oppression that was taking place under the sun. I saw the tears of the oppressed, and they have no comforter. Power was on the side of their oppressors, and they have no comforter. Religious freedom is deeply embedded in our own legal tradition, reaching all the way back to the Magna Carta. But it's also understood as a necessity for human dignity by the international community. As it says in the U.S. Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal, that they endowed by their creator, by God, and they are endowed by God with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These words are known by people. When I go to other countries, they're known by people all over the world. They were known by the students in Tiananmen during the demonstration. You remember when they made the Statue of Liberty there. Religious freedom is a universal value worth protecting, but often abused. 
The Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 18, states explicitly, quote, everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. This right includes freedom to change his or her religion or belief and freedom either alone or in community with others in public or private to manifest his or her religion and belief in teaching, practice, worship, and observance. I stand before you today with a grave and a growing sense of urgency regarding the erosion of religious freedom around the globe. All over this world, people are denied the fundamental and unalienable human right to confess and express their beliefs according to the dictates of their conscience. According to the Pew polling data, nearly 80% of the world's population, over 5.5 billion people, at this very moment when we sit here in this building, live in a religiously repressive nation. The task is urgent. The stakes are high. What remains to be seen is whether people of goodwill will rise to the occasion for such a time like this. Throughout my career, I bore witness to the tragic state of religious persecution as a daily reality, a daily reality for so many people all over the world. From China to Iran, from Pakistan to North Korea to Burma, the face of repression varies, but the outcome is the same. Harassment, fear, imprisonment, and even death, simply because what a person believes. Just look around the world today. The Rohingya in Burma, I believe, are facing genocide. And the world is relatively silent. Christian and Yazidis in Iraq were victims. They were victims of genocide. And 3,000 young Yazidi girls are still being held by ISIS. And Yazidi mass graves have not yet been excavated. The Baha'is in Iran are being persecuted and imprisoned. In Nigeria, 21,000 Christians and many Muslims have been killed, and over 900 churches have been destroyed. And we see, and we see growing anti-Semitism around the world, even here, even here at times in the United States. There are many other situations that you in this room know about. In China alone, we see the Catholic Church being coerced and Catholic bishops disappearing. Congressman Chris Smith, who took Holy Communion from Bishop Sue several years ago, Bishop Sue has never been seen again. Protestant pastors and house church leaders are being jailed. Buddhist monks and nuns are setting themselves on fire to protest the cultural genocide in Tibet. Every place of worship in Tibet has a public security police monitoring the place. Every place, and there are cameras watching the Tibet monks and nuns as they enter and as they leave. And hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Uyghur Muslims, including children, are being taken from their homes and placed in re-education camps. This, I believe, speaking for myself, I believe this is reminiscent of the times of Mao, of Stalin, and Nazis. And yet the world, <laughs> and yet the world is silent. The Falun Gong are facing severe persecution. And there are actual reports of organ harvesting where they kill them and they take the organs for sale. Should we not today be burdened by the great injustice of religious persecution taking place around the world? Those who are persecuted can at times, I know, seem distant from the halls of government and from our churches and synagogues and mosques. But these people, they yearn for our prayers and they cry out. They cry out for our attention. For me, as a father of Jesus, Scripture gives little choice but to respond to the oppression. The book of...
the book of Hebrews enjoins us to, quote, remember those in prison as if you were their fellow prisoners and those who were mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. And the Old Testament book of Isaiah says, and if you spend yourself on behalf of the hungry and you satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will shine in the darkness and your night will become like the noonday. I am convinced personally that as those being persecuted become more than faceless, nameless victims in distant wars and hard to pronounce prison cells, and as we commit, commit to knowing their story, weeping at their wounds, and interceding on their, have, their behalf with prayer and advocacy, that we will find ourselves, we will find ourselves shaped by these men and women. The Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail, which I think is one of the most powerful documents ever written here in the United States, was written to his fellow clergymen. Dr. King said the following. He said, injustice anywhere, he said, injustice anywhere is a threat everywhere. He said, whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. He went on to say, we know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given up by the oppressors. He said it must be demanded. It must be demanded by the oppressed. Dr. King went on to say, he said, there comes a time when the cup of endurance runs over and men and women are no longer willing to be plunged into the abyss of injustice where they experience the bleakness of corroding despair. Waiting for the right time is not an option. The Rohingya in the camps of Burma and Ambassador Brownback saw that. They cannot wait. The Yazidi girl who has been assaulted and sold and is still in ISIS captivity cannot wait. The Coptic the Coptic Christian who is being persecuted in certain places cannot wait. The Catholic Pakistani woman who we all know the name, Asia Bibi, Asia Bibi, who has been in prison for eight years, she cannot wait. The Jabak mother in Nigeria whose daughter is still being held captive by Boko Haram cannot wait. Four years ago, it was hashtag bring back our girls. This past April, four years ago, almost nobody did hashtag bring back our girls, and yet almost 50% of the girls have not come back. The Tibetan monks and nuns in prison in a notorious drop sheet prison in Lhasa cannot wait. And the Christian community that Ambassador Brownback saw two weeks ago in Iraq that had fallen from 1.5 million in 2003 and is now at 200,000 cannot wait. And listening to Pastor Brunson's daughter, Pastor Brunson, I say to our friends in Turkey, Pastor Brunson cannot wait. When asked why he continually spoke out against injustice, Nobel laureate and Holocaust survivor Elie Wiesel said, if I remain silent, he said, I may help my own soul, but because I do not help other people, I poison my soul. He says, silence never helps the victim. It only helps the victimizer. What a powerful statement. Silence never helps the victim. It only helps the victimizers. In fact, silence actually encourages the wrongdoer to continue their acts of violence. In the 18th century, uh, one of my heroes, British parliamentarian, William Wilberforce, said this to his fellow countrymen about the evils of the slave trade. Wilberforce said, you may choose to look the other way, but you can never say again that you do not know. Dr. King said, in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. Are we not the friends of the persecuted? A quote often attributed to German Luther Pastor, an anti-Nazi dissident Dietrich Bonhoeffer says, silence in the face of evil is evil itself. He said not to speak is to speak, not to act is to act. So after attending this ministerial, we can never again say we did not know. When we leave today, let us commit that we will speak, 
and we will act. Thank you very, very much. That's why he's the father of the field. And uh, nobody says it any better than Frank Wolf does, nor means it any more than Frank Wolf does. I hope you've had a great first day. Uh, there are a number of sidebar events that are going on, I think some 20. Uh, Greg Mitchell and the International Religious Freedom Roundtable has put together. Uh, Greg, uh, can, is there a website people can go to to be able to find those? You want to yell that out? Uh, yeah, it's, it's irfroundtable.org. IRFRoundtable.org, thanks to Nathan Weininger over there. The, <laughs> these are not sponsored by State Department, so we don't have anything to do with them. Uh, they're the individuals, but I've been to one already, uh, and it was fantastic of people of like mind and heart uh, really willing to pull uh, on this topic and work together aggressively on it. And so I sure hope you can look at that website. There's going to be a multi-faith service taking place at uh, 530 to 630 at the Jack Morton Auditorium. Does somebody want to uh, yell out anything about that? I know I saw some of the people associated with that. That's, uh, that's taking place a little bit later on. If you want some uh, directions on that, I think you can probably go to that same website. It has, it has information on that. Uh, I do urge you to work with other people uh, a lot uh, and make these sort of connections and not in the standard sort of networking. You know, we've all been to hundreds of different conferences and where you go out and you know, you're thinking, well, this can be a real efficient way to meet other people. And this can be a very efficient way to meet people you may never meet in another setting because this is just a real eclectic topic that attracts us all. But I hope you network in the sense of building relationships with people next to you or that you don't know at all. Uh, so that the networking isn't really about the work, it's about the relationship. Uh, and I find any time I do it that way, I gain a new friend, and I got 10 more things done than I hoped I would if I do it that way, and then instead of just thinking, well, I'm here for this group, and I'm trying to get that done. Uh, it's part of what I was saying about we've got to move beyond tolerance. This can't be just about tolerance anymore, because once, once something bad happens and you tolerate the other person, you decide you can't tolerate them anymore, and then things really go south on you. We've got to get to the point of where we care about each other, and that involves getting to know them and actually build a relationship uh, with them. And you'll, you'll be profoundly changed and impacted in such a positive way, particularly people in this room who care so passionately from the heart and know so much about the terror that others are experiencing that you represent. You know what's going on. You, you have seen it. You've talked to them. They're your relatives. But we need to share that, but we need to have the power of those relationships come together focusing and moving us all forward together in that caring relationship so we can tra truly change the world, and you will. Thank you very much. It's been a great first day. We'll see you back tomorrow. God bless you all.